All right, everybody, let's open God's Word together today and get some encouragement from the Word of the Lord. I want to add to uh, what Kayla said earlier about uh, just being so proud of all of our volunteers and our church staff, our church leadership team, our church board. Uh, people have been just pulling together and uh, we're, we're trying to be creative. As a pastor, I've been so conflicted because on the one hand, I, I really understand this need for some physical distancing, but at the same time, wow, if there was ever a time we need one another, it's right now. And I've been kind of chuckling at myself because uh, you know how many times I kind of poke fun at social media and, uh, and, and kind of warn against it. And lately I've been just saying, thank God for social media. So uh, there's certainly some, some good things about being able to connect with, with one another, uh, including uh, just something that we came up with last Wednesday night. We did a virtual prayer meeting right from my home on Facebook live, and uh, it was just me and, and Janice and Pastor Roger and Teresa and our producer, Val Coleman, and uh, we just gathered together in my living room, and uh, we led in prayer requests, and, and about 70, 70 of you joined us, and it was just a great time of praying together, and you have the opportunity to send in prayer requests, and, and uh, it was just a really, really special time. So we're going to do that again this Wednesday, Facebook Live at 7 o'clock. Uh, for a, 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 prayer, a prayer time together. Uh, you know, God is using all of this. Uh, it's interesting that God is always able uh, to take things that seem so chaotic and troublesome, and he uses those things somehow together for good. Uh, last year, as I was praying about this coming year for our church, the Lord impressed on me about the importance about of talking about the goodness of God. So all year we've been talking about the goodness of God, not knowing that we were going to go through what we're going through right now. And I want you to know that God is good on our best day and God is good on our most difficult day. God is still good. And we need to have confidence in that. And I, I just believe that from the very beginning of the year, God was getting us ready as a church for what we're experiencing right now. One of the scriptures that we looked at early on was Genesis chapter one, uh, where God took complete chaos. Remember, uh, everything was out without form and void, and, and God created something so beautiful out of chaos. And so God does this. And then later on in the book of Genesis, we have the very human story about Joseph and how chaotic his life was. All the ups and downs and all the things that Joseph went through. But in all of it, God was with him, seeing him through all of it. And at the end, uh, in this dramatic scene, Joseph is reunited with his brothers. And, and he says this to them, what you intended for evil... God intended for good. So I'm really believing that through all of this, God is going to bring good out of, out of it. And one of the things that we've been saying as a church is that when this thing is all over, we're actually, actually going to be a better church than we were before this happened. And I'm believing that for my own life too. I'm saying, Lord, through all of this, I want to become more like Jesus. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that today uh, in Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. It says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So let's start by putting a little bit of context uh, to this message, to this uh, portion of scripture. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus had just finished calling the very last of his 12 disciples uh, who would follow him throughout his ministry on earth. And it happened to be Matthew, uh, who was a tax collector. And 
Interestingly enough, it's Matthew that wrote what we just read. Uh, and then after that, he heals a woman who had been, uh, had a, a blood hemorrhage for 12 years. And then he raised a, a, a girl from the dead, a, a young girl from the dead. He heals two blind men, uh, blind men and then he uh, cast demons out of, uh, out of a man that was demon possessed. And so Jesus and his 12 disciples are traveling all around together and they're doing what Jesus always did teaching, proclaiming the kingdom of God, healing, casting out demons, loving people. And so I want us to come back and just circle around and come back to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 again. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time together. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In the past couple of weeks, as things have been unfolding before our very eyes, this passage of scripture has come to my, my mind so many times. And so I, I want us to look at this whole scene from three different perspectives, all right? The first one is, the first perspective is the, G, the people that Jesus was sent to, uh, the people Jesus was sent to. And there are three words that Matthew uses to describe these people. They were harassed, helpless, and like sheep without a shepherd. So first of all, it says they were harassed. They were harassed. So clearly, uh, they had a lot of health issues because Jesus was healing a lot of people. They didn't have hospitals like we have today. Many of them were poor. They were financially stressed to the limit. Uh, they were under the thumb of a foreign government. And even their own religious leaders, who should have been the people bringing the most encouragement, these leaders we learn were hypocritical. They were self-righteous. They were judgmental. They were oppressive. So the very people that should have been encouraging them were actually discouraging them even more. So the people felt absolutely harassed. And then a second word that Matthew uses is they were, they were helpless. Now, when it says they're helpless, it's not like they weren't trying. It's just that things were so difficult, they couldn't make their own way out. They needed help. But until Jesus came along, they didn't see any help coming. You know, there's many things in our life that we're able to handle uh, on our own, and we should, but at some point, we just feel like we're outnumbered, right? And that can make us feel so helpless, but I want you to know today, with Jesus, you're not helpless. In fact, the Bible says we are more than conquerors, that no matter what is going on circumstantially in our lives, we are never helpless because the Lord is on our side. And then the, the third thing that Matthew says about these folks is that they are like sheep without a shepherd. Now, that's quite a sad picture when you think about it, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I haven't been around a lot of sheep, but I got to say, when I'm out in the highway and I'm driving by sheep, I kind of like them. They're kind of cute. But what a sad picture. Sheep with no shepherd, no one to protect them, no one to see to their needs, to feed them, to tend to their wounds if they're injured. No one to lead them or guide them. This is how Matthew describes the people were before Jesus came along. But then along comes Jesus, right? And the Bible often uses this description of the Lord, that the Lord is a shepherd. So David in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus said of himself, I am the good shepherd. So he is the one that comes along and he leads and guides and protects and encourages and gives us strength. So I want you to know today, if you feel kind of like you're wandering and alone, uh, like a sheep without a shepherd, I want you to know you have a great shepherd that you can look to. And he, he is going to be with you no matter what. 
So that's the first perspective, the perspective of, of the crowds of people, the multitudes of people. The second perspective uh, I want you to think about is the perspective of Jesus, of Jesus himself. What do we learn about Jesus? It says that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. So this, this shows us the heart of Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. On them, I want you to know that uh, that Jesus is not um, without feeling. He's not with uh, he's he's not without compassion. He has compassion and he's loving. and And I think about Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus with uh, his sis Lazarus's sisters there, and and uh, the people that were mourning. The Bible says that Jesus wept. You know, some of the some of the movies that, are, especially earlier movies that where Jesus is in them. Uh, it shows Jesus as kind of being almost robotic, unfeeling. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is compassionate and, and feeling. And notice in this verse, three things about Jesus. First of all, he saw, all right? He saw what was going on. And I want you to know he sees you today. He sees you today. And then he cared but not only did he care, he did something about it. This word compassion in the Greek indicates that uh, Jesus didn't just observe from a distance and feel bad for them, that he had compassion, and that means that he was actually moved to take action, all right? That he actually did something uh, about the troubling times that people were going through. He was moved to action. So this beautiful picture of Jesus. Now the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And with everything that's going on in our world, I want you to know Jesus still sees, he still cares, and he will still do something about it. And then a third perspective. Um, and, and this one, we kind of read between the lines. There's a third group of people uh, that this this. Uh, story talks about, but they're not mentioned, uh, but we know they're there. The third perspective is the perspective of the disciples. So the disciples were all there watching Jesus, including Matthew, who wrote all of this down so we could read it today. And so they're traveling right along with Jesus, and they're watching him do all of these things. And this is what a disciple is. This is what disciples do. A disciple is someone who walks with Jesus someone who walks with him and learns from him, someone who watches what he does and then does what he does, all right? So if you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus, this is your job description. You're gonna walk with Jesus and learn from him. You're gonna watch what he does and you're gonna do what he does. You know, we all, we all begin to take on the characteristics of the people we hang out with. And as we spend time with Jesus in prayer, as we're filled with his Holy Spirit, as we're spending time in his word, we will start to become more and more like him. And as we do that, we're going to do what Jesus did. And eventually we see those 12 disciples becoming more and more like Jesus. And then as you carry on and read through the book, book of Acts, we find the disciples doing the things that Jesus did when he was on the earth. Not only does Jesus set an example for us, though, he actually empowers us to do what he did because he fills us with his Holy Spirit. So he gives us a powerful example to follow, but actually he does more than that. He fills us with the power to do the things that he did. And so you might be thinking to yourself today, well, Tim, I don't really have enough love. I really don't have enough grace. I don't have enough compassion. I don't have enough courage. I want you to know that because of the Lord, no matter how great you feel like your shortcomings are, through the power of his Holy Spirit, God will empower you to live like Jesus. He will give you a heart like Jesus he will give you wisdom like Jesus. He will give you grace like Jesus and compassion like Jesus. So when you're saying to yourself, I don't have enough, I can't do this, uh, I don't have what it takes, uh, I, I want to say to you today, well, no, actually you do. 
you do have what it takes because Jesus is in you. So that's our challenge for this morning, and it's a challenge for this week. Let's do what Jesus did. Let's do what Jesus did. This time that we're living in, as terrible as it is, there's an opportunity in it for us. There's an opportunity not to just go to church, but to be the church. So I want to challenge you today. Let's make a difference. Light shines the most bright when things are dark. And so in this day that we're living in, let's let the light of Jesus Christ shine so brightly through our lives. We're surrounded by so many people that have been impacted. They're discouraged, they're confused, right? And perhaps you've had some of those feelings yourself and I want to encourage you, bring those things to the Lord in prayer. One of the awesome things about God is he's given us the gift of prayer. And through prayer, God is available. His presence is available 24-7. Now God is always with us for sure, but prayer gives us the opportunity to acknowledge his presence to acknowledge that he's with us, to talk to him about anything and let him speak into our lives as well. And so I want to encourage you in all of this, take your own needs to the Lord and then be available to be used by Jesus to make a difference in other people's lives. So I want to encourage you today uh, with, with three different ways uh, three different specific ways I want to challenge you with even this week to make a difference. First of all, I want to encourage you to check in with an elderly person, okay? Check in with someone elderly. Now, none of you better call me, but someone older than me, okay? Uh, I'm going to ask each of you this week, maybe it's one of our church members, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a neighbor. Uh, elderly people can already feel somewhat isolated, but uh, with what we're going through right now, they're going to feel even more isolated. So just a phone call, uh, a text message, whatever it might be, just saying, how you doing? It, do you need anything? Can I run to the store for you? Uh, and just be a blessing and be used by the Lord that way. Uh, secondly, I want to encourage you, as Kayla mentioned earlier, to go on to the Bethel Church Facebook page, and then there's going to be a feed there uh, specifically about sharing needs and meeting needs, all right? So you can go on there. If you're in need of something, you can go on to that Facebook page, put that need in, or if you're able to help, you can also uh, write about that there. And, and this, we felt, was like the best way that we as a church family uh, could connect with one another uh, concerning people's needs. Um, so that's, that, that's the second thing I, I want to encourage you to do. And the third thing that I would encourage you to do is to give. Give to the Bethel Church Benevolence Fund, or if Bethel's not your home church, give to your church's Benevolence Fund, because there's going to be people with some practical needs, right? And so this is a way, as a church family, we can minister to, to people that might be struggling. And, uh, and, and just a reminder to all of us, um, this time is not going to last forever, but let's make the most of every opportunity in the time that we're in right now, and let's really love the Lord, draw close to Him, and love one another. Love your family, love your, love your neighbors, as Jesus said to do, love your church family, uh, and, and allow yourself to be used by God to make a difference in somebody's life. Uh, you know, I was thinking about the early church, the early church was so powerful, uh, and, and they just started with a handful of people, but when the power of the Holy Spirit filled their lives, they so impacted their community uh, that, that the whole city of Jerusalem was turned upside down, and people were coming to faith in Christ, people were being healed, uh, the favor of God was upon that early church, uh, and it was an amazing time. But, but something happened where the early church just kind of got comfortable in doing church the way they, they had learned to do church. 
And so they settled in. Remember the commission that Jesus gave the early church is that they were going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and they were going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, but then they, it wasn't supposed to stop there. Then they were going to go to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But what we find in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, after the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts chapter 2, they just stay in Jerusalem. And, and it's kind of like God was moving and, and everybody was happy and the church was growing and people were comfortable and the church was thriving and it was all good, except for they really weren't fulfilling what Jesus had told them to do. And the thing that got them out of their comfort bubble and got them moving forward in the mission actually was something none of us would want to go through. They went through persecution. And in Acts chapter 7, we read about the very first Christian martyr, a man by the name of Stephen, who was stoned to death. And then in Acts chapter 8, persecution breaks out against the church, and the church actually is forced to leave the city of Jerusalem. And guess where they go when they leave Jerusalem? They go to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what I'm saying is it, is it took an event, an uncomfortable event, an awful event, to get them back on mission. And so I'm believing, church, in the days that we're living in, God is going to use all of this. And the church, we are, we're learning that it's not just about coming to church on Sunday morning, right? We don't have that right now. And yet the church is still alive and thriving. And Jesus is with us. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So I believe that in these days, as, as terrible as it is, as difficult as it is, I want you to know that God is going to use it. And if that means getting us out of what we're comfortable with, so be it so we can get back on mission and be doing the things that Jesus had called us to do. Man, I got to tell you, I'm excited to see what God is going to do in the days ahead. I'm excited about where God is taking Bethel Church, and I'm excited about what God is going to do in your life as well. And so I'd like to pray with you, and let's pray together. Lord, help us to be disciples. I mean, really disciples. People who are walking with you and watching you. We're learning from you, Lord. And then, Lord, you're changing our hearts. And then because you're changing our hearts, we're going to do the things that you do. Lord, help me to be a disciple. So I'm going to ask you right now, right at home, to just bow your heads with me, whether you're with your family or friends. Let's bow our hearts together in a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask you just right now to respond to this message. And, and first of all, if you're a follower of Jesus, but you want to be taken to a deeper place of discipleship, of pressing in, uh, of, of, of seeing the crowds that are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd and being moved to compassion, moved to action, all right? If that's you, I want to pray for you. But also, I want to pray for you today. If you've not walked with the Lord, maybe you've never really surrendered your heart to Jesus, and perhaps you've found yourself in uh, these times that we're living in, perhaps you've realized even more than ever that there's something missing from your life, that, uh, that, that you're not sure if God forbid something should happen to you and, and you would uh, find yourself uh, dying, or leaving this life, and you're not sure, man, what would be next for me? I want you to know that God is the giver of eternal life. That is why Jesus came. Jesus came into this world so that we could know God. Our sins could be forgiven and we could have eternal life. So I'm going to invite you to pray along with me a very simple prayer right there in your home to receive Jesus Christ into your heart and life. And I'm, I'm going to just pray one phrase at a time. I'm going to invite you right at home to just pray this in your heart along with me. Lord Jesus, I bring my life to you today. God, and today I recognize my need for you. God, that my life is empty without you, that I don't have a sense of direction, that I am like a sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus, I want you to be the shepherd of my life. Lord, today I ask you to forgive me of my sins 
Jesus, I thank you for your love. And I believe you love me so much that you died on a cross for me. Lord, today, I invite you to come into my heart, into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, Lord, I I wanna pray for every person that they already know you, but God, you're taking them to a deeper place of discipleship. Lord, we wanna grow in you. We wanna take advantage of this time that we're in. God, to press into you even more and learn even more that you really are the shepherd of our souls, Lord, that you care about us, you love us, Lord, you're with us no matter what. God, I pray, Lord, for every person here, not only, Lord, that we're going to look to you and draw closer to you, but, Lord, that we're going to be used by you to make a difference in our neighborhood and with our family and our church family. God, that you're going to use us to be a blessing to other people. Help us not to shrink back, uh, not to become hoarders. God, not to withdraw ourselves, Lord. Help us to put ourselves out there and to continue to be caring and loving and compassionate and generous, Lord. God, that where there has been death, there's gonna be life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I I wanna pray not only for a survival attitude, but God, I wanna pray, Lord, that actually the joy of the Lord would be our strength, God. Lord, that no matter what happens, we remember, God, that we're on the winning team, Lord, with you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.